Mr. Jose Wezar, I anticipate that Mr. LeBange will arrive shortly. So, Madam Clerk, we do have a quorum. What uh, do we have going today? Anything at all? <laughs> there are a few items on the regular agenda and additional items on the special agenda this morning. Okay, why don't we uh, take up some of the uh, non-controversial items first. Those would be items one through eight. And if Mr. Wezar does not have a problem with those uh, items, without objection, we will deem those items approved. Now, do you want to read them into the record? Yes, I would. Go right ahead. Thank you. Items one through eight are reports from the chief legislative analyst and resolutions. Item one is relative to establishing the city's position to support a federal transportation bill. Item two is to support S-1301 to combat human trafficking. Item three is to support the Marketplace Equity Act and the Marketplace Fairness Act. Item four is to support H.R. 3274 relative to low volume car manufacturers. Item number five is to support Proposition 30 to increase the sales tax and income taxes to generate revenues for schools and local public safety. Item six is to support Proposition 39, the California Clean Energy Jobs Act. And item seven is to revise the McKinney-Vento funding formula to promote factors that better correlate with homelessness. And item number eight is to establish the city's position to support Measure J. Okay, thank you. So what I'm going to do is I have uh, cards on item one, so we'll hold that item. And I also have cards on item eight. We will hold that item as well. So on items two through uh, seven, those will be deemed approved. So why don't we start out? I've got a general public comment card, one from uh, Dr. Tom Williams. So if you'd come forward, Dr. Williams, we'll start out with you, and then we'll move to item one. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Yesterday we had a meeting over in the MTA building. One of the issues there was call for projects from MTA uh, for the year 2013. In the past, these projects have not had the contribution of neighborhood councils. I was, it was explained to me that the rule is that it goes through the mayor's office to the council members and from the council members to whoever they wish without inclusion of the neighborhood councils. We have 90 some odd neighborhood councils, I think actually over 100 now. And it's a department within the city. So why doesn't MTA go through the city to LADOT to the neighborhood councils for call for projects 2013. I don't know what the rule is. It's just been accepted. So neighborhood councils would like to get a chance at recommending what they know to be important to their neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now uh, let's move on to item one. Why don't you read that item again, and then I'll ask for Jared Wright and Beth Steckler to come forward. Item number one is to support a federal transportation bill modeled after the Senate's MAP 21. Mr. Wright. Good, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Rules Committee. I'm speaking in behalf of supporting item number one, which is uh, enabling cities as well as regions to build and leverage their, their financing mechanisms to improve our infrastructure of transportation. Transportation means mobility, not just for workers, not just for people building, but it means mobility for everyone. And this is a very vital step into making that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Beth? Hi, thank you. Beth Steckler with Move LA. Um, we're fully in support of this resolution. 
Um, it's very exciting how Los Angeles is leading the way with America Fast Forward. That came out of our 3010 initiative, um, which Move LA, MTA, and Mayor Villaraigosa were part of it. It was one of the only things that got bipartisan, bicameral support in Washington, D.C. this year in the Federal Transportation Reauthorization Bill. So it's really, we think the, the city has done a fabulous job on this. MTA has done a fabulous job. Our coalition includes uh, labor and the major um, business groups. Uh, so it is something that there is widespread support, but it's particularly exciting because Los Angeles has been on the lead on this innovative policy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, unless you have some concerns, Mr. Wezar, it's my intention to, uh, on this item, that we adopt the CLA report and resolution. And uh, since uh, Mr. Wezar has no objections, then that will be the order. We'll now move to item eight. I have public comment cards on item eight as well. Dr. Williams, Mr. Wright, Ms. Steckler, and Tina Hassan from the LA Chamber. Please come forward. And item eight is relative to supporting an extension of Measure J. Please come forward. Dr. Williams, you're first. Dr. Tom Williams, LA 32 Neighborhood Council Land Use Chairperson. Measure J, or we call it the joke. It's a joke on us. Problem, $41 billion worth of projects. However, if you look at the detail, there's one group of projects that has an unfunded $13 billion price tag on it. Go to line 50 on the last page of the spreadsheets, and it says, no funds for this. What's going to happen? We're concerned that there will be reallocations. Once this is approved, there will be reallocations based upon a majority vote of the board of MTA. They've already gotten the one-year clock taken off by the assembly and by the state legislature, and they can pretty much do what they want. It becomes a slush fund. But a 13 billion out of 41 billion unfunded, we don't know where the funds are gonna come from. They may come from the state, they may come from the feds, well, I doubt it, or local, that's a possibility, or private, public-private partnerships. Great concept, I've done a couple myself. And they usually come out the private plundering or pillaging the public. Private plundering the public, us. So we're quite concerned about Measure J and we would recommend that you not support Measure J for this November's election. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wright, followed by Beth Steckler. Uh, Sierra Club Angeles Chapter Transportation Committee, and in front of me is a map. I don't know if the cameras can see it, but we'll, we'll find a way to get it shown. Uh, the important part with Measure J, not just is the acceleration of major vital transportation projects, transit projects, that benefit not only the city, but the region as a whole. The, the joke that some have used to s claim that this will not benefit future generations is, beside, is further from the truth. The fact that folks can get on to UCLA, to West Side jobs, to improved jobs in the South Bay and other parts of the region because of the accelerated infrastructure is a vital piece of Measure J. Another vital piece that is sometimes gets glossed over and overlooked is the very essence of shifting highway dollars to transit. That is an important provision that the subregions is in, in of local control can dictate shifting those monies from highway to transit. A number of subregions have shown interest in that. That means there's greater likelihood of more transit, non-highway modes of movement and mobility 
to the city and county residents of Los Angeles. This is an important step, and we can, and we just approved resolution to take it to the city council for the TIFI alone. This is the two work together. We're at a, a monumental time in that interest rates are low, that people are unemployed. This is a wonderful opportunity to bridge, to get more for our taxpayer dollars, and to put people back to work so that stimulates more tax growth for this vital region. With that, I close and I thank you. Thank you. That's Steckler, Move LA. Um, so we're urging you to support Measure J. I know many of you do. We have recently gotten um, editorial support from the LA Times, the Daily News, the San Gabriel Valley Tribune, the Long Beach Press Telegram, the Pasadena Star News, and the Whittier Daily News. And that's because Measure J is good for Los Angeles and good for the whole county. I just came um, earlier this week, and maybe some of you were, at the Railvolution National Conference here in Los Angeles. And I'm telling you, all eyes are on Los Angeles. Um, what's happening with the Measure R program, the Measure J program, is, is transformational. Um, we are very excited about it. 20% of the funds in Measure R and consequently in Measure J are for bus operations, 5% for rail operations, 15% for local return for local cities and the, and the county to, figure, to use for their, um, pers their, their individualized transportation needs, and we get this transit expansion. So it's a, it's a balanced approach. And it's a transformational approach. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to you supporting this. Thank you. Thank, thank you. OK, Tina, followed by Roy, Roy Miller, followed by Damian Goodman. Yes, good to good see morning. you again. Good to see you as well. Good morning. My name is Tina Hossein. I'm here representing the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce and our 1,600 member organizations. This chamber was a strong supporter of Measure R, leading partners on America Fast Forward, and we now urge your support on Measure J as the next step in expediting the build out of our transportation system. Measure J would give voters the power to accelerate transportation projects, creating desperately needed new jobs in a county with 530,000 unemployed workers, roughly 40% of whom are in construction. At the same time, our residents hunger for congestion and relief, for congestion relief. Measure J will provide more transportation options for residents and visitors, enhance the delivery of goods and services, and improve our environment and quality of life. As the largest business organization in LA County, we know it's important to act quickly while construction prices and interest rates are low and companies are looking for work. Now is the time to jumpstart transportation projects as an engine for economic recovery. The Chamber asked the Council to support Measure J and the economic growth, environmental benefits, and improvements to quality of life it will bring to all of Los Angeles. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, Jason, where is Ron? Damien, oh, I was looking for you. You disappeared, Ron. Damien, you next, followed by Joanna Caspar. Go on, Ron. Good morning. I'm Ron Miller with the LA Orange County Building Trades. We represent 140,000 craftsmen and women. Building Trades stands in support of Measure J. This is going to accelerate very. Uh, many transit projects by at least 10 to 15 years, getting them complete earlier. This is some money that we can spend for our kids' future that's going to provide good transportation into, way into the future, good projects, while uh, construction interest rates are very low. And it's going to provide a chance for LA City and the county to finally have a world-class transit system, much like other cities in the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Damian Goodman, I see my good friend Steve Soboroff in the back. How's my goddaughter? All right, Damian, good to see you, man. Good to see you, Mr. President. It is indeed a pleasure to address the Council's first African-American president. Thank you. I am Damian Goodman, the chair of the Crenshaw Subway Coalition, which has joined the coalition to defeat Measure J. Why? Why is the Crenshaw Subway Coalition involved? Because for us in South LA, Measure J stands for jacked. We are getting jacked, Council President. You know it, they know it, and as a board member, so does your fellow committee member know it, as a board member of MTA. Allow me to put this in terms you know intimately. $90 billion about the budget of this state of California. 
Imagine you're, I don't know, the Speaker of the Assembly of California, and the, 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 the Democratic leadership has proposed something to you that provides not a penny to the infrastructure project by which you will be judged by the constituents in your community and by which the black community will judge you and provides no protection to the bus service that your, res that your constituents within your district provide you. That is the stark, unfortunate reality that faces 10th District residents, residents throughout the city of Los Angeles. Not a penny, despite the fact that you, Council President, in leadership with other uh, African Americans uh, throughout the state of California, went to the Metro Board less than a year ago and requested the amount of money that necessary to underground the line in Park Mesa Heights and to add a station in Lemur Park Village. And what was the message? The message was no. Some of the board members here or were the individuals who said no. The board members who are pushing this proposition, the sales tax increase on working families, said no. And now they are asking you, Council President, to say yes. Yes to a proposition that has $90 billion and provides not a single penny to the Crenshaw line. Not a single level of protection to bus service for your, for your constituents. Don't get pumped. This is raw politics at its worst. South LA is, is, is going to be hurt by it. And if you allow them to, to lock in 57 years of transportation dollars without us getting our fair share, well, that, that's just not a, that's not, that mean, that would mean that, that your ascension is simply symbolic thank, and not meaningful. Thank you, Damien. But uh, let me tell you, we are going to have a station. I would all but guarantee that. So. Will we get additional we, funds? I, no, we're not going to have a back and forth. I just wanted to throw that out at you. Joanna Gaspar, followed by. Felipe, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce the last name. Mr. Wezar, can you help me out? Villarreal. Felipe Villarreal. And Eric, I think it's Eric Roman. Yes, go ahead. Hi, my name is Joanna Gaspar. I'm a member of the um, Bus Riders Union and a part-time student and a part-time worker as well. Uh, I've seen firsthand the dirty tricks and false promises that the MTA has um, handed us since Measure R went into effect in 2009. Measure J uh, proponents claim that, measures, um, that Measure J is all about jobs, but when workers and unemployed people like myself pleaded with the MTA board not to cut our bus service, um, a certain uh, board member from uh, the MTA uh, told us that it was um, not their business and didn't give a damn about losing our jobs. Um, and, that, and that day, the MTA board approved the biggest package of service cuts in its history. This shows the blatantly disregard that the MTA um, shows for millions of bus riders and makes the MTA's claims for jobs a joke. Measure J will um, only set an overdrive process that started with Measure R, which is an assault on the bus system and that's why um, I'm urging you to vote no on Measure J. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So, Felipe, where's the sergeant? Could you do me a favor and move the center chair right here? Okay. Yeah, just move it to the side. Good morning. Uh, buenos días. Mi nombre es Felipe Villarreal. Eh, yo soy miembro del sindicato y, y trabajador común de... So good morning, my name is Felipe Villarreal and I am a member of the Bus Riders Union and also a worker. Eh, yo vengo a exponer mi punto de vista en el sentido de que la medida J es solo una extensión para seguir violando los derechos civiles. And I came here to let you know that Measure J is only an extension of um, violating our civil rights. Ya que esa medida solo está buscando cómo aumentar nuestros costos de pasajes y quitarnos los autobuses que nosotros utilizamos todos los días. And that in reality, Measure J is going to um, increase service cuts and um, fare increases. Eh, es no, nosotros la, la clase eh, más uh, vulnerable, eh, las damas de casa, los trabajadores de carguas, eh, todos nosotros sabemos que vamos a perder mucho más uh, con esta medida. We know as uh, the most vulnerable workers, like domestic workers, um, um, janitors, um, different folks that are in the service sector are going to be the most impacted by this measure as we see our services get cut. Ahora mismo batallamos mucho para recibir el servicio de autobuses. Este, tenemos muchos recortes y con esta medida solo quieren aumentarnos los costos de pasajes. 
We're saying we're struggling so much right now, fighting at MTA tooth and nail to try to save our service. And um, the only thing we're going to get in return are fare increases as well. La MTA dice que con los impuestos que nos impondrá, ellos tendrán a, a nuevos proyectos, pero los trabajos de construcción en los que se lleva ese tiempo solo son temporales y los impuestos van a ser por más de 30 años y los pagaremos nosotros, la clase trabajadora. So, despite MTA's promise of jobs, it's only at a certain sector. It's the uh, construction sector and it's temporary jobs because they don't last long. And But at the end of the day, it's... 30 years of taxes that all working class people are going to be paying. Así que por favor esperamos que piensen en la comunidad trabajadora que somos los que usamos esos autobuses y pues no tenemos tanto dinero como para estar pagando por muchísimo tiempo esos impuestos. So, I, I urge you that you all think about the all workers, um, uh, working class people, and what the burden it, uh, is going to look like when we see our service shrinking at the same time we're paying more for it. Gracias. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, I believe it's Eric Roman, <laughs> Roman, Rosa Miranda, Sun Young Yang. Yes, sir. Good morning, council members. Eric Roman, also from the Bus Riders Union. Let me tell you a little bit about who is uh, behind and actively supporting Measure J. AEG, Westfield Corporation, Let's see who else. Parsons Brinkerhoff, J.M.B. Realty, Eli Bird, CH2M Hill. These are companies that stand to make billions of dollars, right? It's no accident that they filled the coffers of the Measure J campaign with $3 million of campaign contributions. It's a public investment. Maybe each of them gives 100 grand, 200 grand. What they get in return is hundreds of million, if not billions of dollars in contracts from the MTA. We're talking about construction contracts, CH2M Hill is responsible for the EIR for the 710 tunnel, right? And they're supporting Measure J because they know that's an open line of credit for, for, measure, for the MTA to hand out contracts to them and other contractors to build a $14 billion boondoggle tunnel, worse than the big dig in Boston. Parsons Brinkerhoff knows they're in, the, they're in the lead to get contract to build the subway to the west side, right? This is not money for workers, this is money for big contractors on the other side of the fence, we have grassroots communities from all across South LA, from Pico Union, from East and Northeast LA, from the San Fernando Valley, from Koreatown, who know the whole impact that this will have. We're, we're not only talking about um, the impacts on bus we're talking about the evisceration of communities. We know what's happened in Braille Heights um, with massive displacement through the construction of the Braille Line with small businesses put out of business. Um, the same thing is threatened for the Crenshaw community. That's why grassroots communities across the city have united against Measure J to stand up to this corporate boondoggle. We say no to the corporate boondoggle, no to the open line of credit to MTA for crony capitalism. We urge you today to vote no on Measure J. Thank you. Thank you. Rosa Miranda, followed by Sun Young Yang. Buenos días a este comité. Mi nombre es Rosa Miranda. Soy miembro del Sindicato de Pasajeros. Good morning. My name is Rosa Miranda. I'm a member of the Pasajeros Union. Uh, mis hijos y yo somos dependientes del transporte público, pero también soy una organizadora este, en los autobuses y me doy cuenta de la mentira que prometió la medida R. Myself and my children are transit dependent. Um, are dependent on public transit, but I'm also, as a member of the BRU, an organizer, and I realize the lies um, uh, that Measure R has promised us. Con la medida R prometieron que el 20% era para transporte público. With Measure R, MTA promised us 20% for the bus system. Pero en estos en estos cuatro años. Esta medida R fue una mentira para todos los pasajeros. Tuvimos un millón de horas de servicio que nos eliminaron y una alza de tarifas en un momento de crisis económica para toda la clase trabajadora. But this has been a lie from the MTA. From the MTA. Um, it's very sad that they've eliminated a million hours of bus service and an increase in fares um, in the middle of a major economic crisis. Nos damos cuenta, usted concejal José Huizar, se ha dado cuenta que nosotros estábamos ahí 
y siempre la mesa directiva decía, alguien se tiene que sacrificar, cuando sabíamos que existía el 20% y nunca tomaron estos fondos. I was there and you were there, uh, Council Member Lisa, at the MTA, um, where the board told us someone has to sacrifice. Um, and yet we knew that there was 20% dedicated for the bus system and you still cut the service. Esta medida J es algo inmoral para toda la clase trabajadora, para latinos y afroamericanos, para los pasajeros de autobús. This measure J is something immoral for, work, for the working class for blacks, Latinos, and for workers that ride the bus. Que pretenden que el, que el impuesto dure hasta el 2069. Este es un impuesto regresivo que cae principalmente en las espaldas de la clase trabajadora que sufrieron en la crisis económica. This tax until 2069 is a regressive tax that will fall mostly on the backs of the working class who have suffered in the midst of a major economic crisis. La medida R básicamente se propuso por 30 años. Es algo injusto que cuatro años después digan, ah, nos equivocamos, necesitamos 30 años más hasta el 2069. Measure R was for 30 years. It's, un it's unjust that just four years later they say, oh, sorry, we made a mistake. Actually, we need it for 60 years. Necesitamos que ustedes se opongan a esto y sobre todo se mantengan firmes para apoyar a la clase trabajadora. We urge you to oppose this measure and to maintain uh, firm in opposing this measure in support of the working class. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Yang, Sun Yung, there you are. Good morning, committee members. <laughs> My name is Sun Yung Yang, lead organizer of the Bus Riders Union. Let's get the record straight. MTA is not an agency to be trusted. Only after four years of securing $40 billion from taxpayers, they have eliminated a million hours of bus service and raised fares. What is so pro-transit about Measure R or MTA? We all know that MTA has no interest in operating or maintaining transit. It's a construction contract agency. It's a developer agency. And this city today, this city council is about to vote on a resolution that is gonna be complicit to that kind of, of policy. We call this Measure J as a corporate whitewash of the city. It's not only bus riders that have been displaced, your core transit users have been displaced from the very transit system. And the very transit-oriented development projects that this uh, measure and many of the projects that MTA is promoting is actually leading to displacement and gentrification of our most, most ethnic neighborhoods. So while you have your core transit users and many of your working class people of color being displaced to places like Lancaster and Palmdale and having to be forced to drive, what kind of environmental accomplishment or transit ridership accomplishment does this really have? It's not about what the project is, but who the project is being built for, how is it being prioritized. And at the end of the day, this is an anti-worker, anti-environment, a whitewash displacement of the city um, measure. And we've seen MTA say, there's 20%, we threw you a bone, 20% for operation for buses, bull crap. It was a bait and switch. We have $120 million less in bus, total bus operations than it should have been if they maintain in levels in 2008 and 2009. So don't fool us, voters are not stupid, bus riders are not stupid. If the city wants to be complicit to this whitewash, corporate whitewash or boondoggle measure, you thank know, you. the, the public you. will be your judges. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, generally, when we begin a discussion on an item, I do not accept any more cards from the public. But I do have just one card, and I will allow this person to speak for one minute. But generally, once we begin on an item, the, the public comment, you have to have your card in prior. So we have an Ellis Arkless. So I'll give you a minute. I don't want you to come down here and not be afforded an opportunity to speak. So good morning. Good morning. Hi, my name is Ellis Arkless. I'm a member with the Bus Riders Union. As a part-time student, Measure J doesn't offer me anything. All Measure J is go just going to do is crumble the bus system even more at 
and even raise fares for even for every two years for a total of 60 years. Measure R isn't done yet. We're only in the fourth year. Um, we, still, we still have to worry about 30 years of debt. This is a multi-generation tax as measure, as measure J. So that means that my kids and my grandkids will be paying for this. Um, why should I trust MTA with the, tri with the rap sheet that you guys have? And Measure J is a, like a, limit, a limitless credit card that the taxpayer have to pay for later on in 30 and 60 years. Um, you guys always continue to tax or off, always ask the bus rider to pay for all you guys is worthless projects that's not going to really help anyone. 85% is bus riders, and yet you always want to worry about 10% of rail. Thank you. Thank you, Ellis. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Good day. All right. Uh, there are no more public comment cards on item 8. Um, Mr. Weezar, unless you have some questions, Madam Clerk, we will deem that item approved. We will adopt the CLA report and the resolution. That brings us now to item nine. And item nine. Item nine is a motion, Wesson, Krikorian, Garcetti et al., relative to drafting a resolution for a measure to be placed on the election ballot that would provide a dedicated revenue stream and raise $39 per parcel in additional revenue for city parks and parks programs. Okay, I want to say before we begin this that yes, I, I I, uh, I'm not certain if I'm going to call for an official vote on this item and then when we get into the other part of the agenda I believe I'll just send it uh, to the the council floor I just want to make sure that I have placeholders because I we still have a lot of work to do before we figure out exactly what it is we're going to do with the next item so I wanted to to let the folk know that that's um, where I am on on this and if Mr. Wees are concerned uh, com concurs with me then that's what we'll do so again yes mr. president and that's exactly it I think we uh, need some additional information before we actually could take action on this so at some point we need the CLA CRA uh, CAO reports and other information for us to be informed and I agree I just want to give them something to work okay. with I want to make sure we have a uh, meet deadline requirements so that's we'll, we'll just okay. kind of go through this but I do have public comment cards on this and I want to start off with uh, Steve Soboroff followed by Mark Glassock followed by Mike McCosker hey Steve -o. morning you know um, last time I saw you was at, at the Endeavor walk and you were yes. out with a crowd and the crowd was a million three hundred thousand people and there was not one arrest over three days with Endeavor. And it shows what happens when the wonderful people of Los Angeles get opportunities to recreate and share in common goals. And that's why I'm for saving our park system. Programmatically, uh, there is no great city in America that doesn't have a great park system. Great. There's no safe city in America that doesn't have a great park system. And there's no environmentally clean system in America that doesn't have a great park system. The park system in Los Angeles, unfortunately, is, um, is a stepping child for taking money away from programs um, because of other really important needs. So we feel there are a whole lot of people out there a lot more than two-thirds plus one that are real interested in keeping up the programming in their local parks. It increases not only all real estate values, who doesn't want to have a home around a great park, but it also makes our city a safer place and a cleaner place and a place where people want to be. This is a great city. We need a great, a great park system. And we can't keep increasing the park's budget by $8 million and at the same time charging back $45 million and taking away classes um, and programs for all kinds of people, just like those 1,300,000 people that we saw the other day. 
Thanks for your time. Now, thanks for coming down. And, it, and I have to say, it was an amazing sight. And I walked a few paces with you down. Yes, it was an amazing thing to see. I'm glad I was there. Thank you, sir. Mark, followed by Mike McCosker. Yes, sir. Good morning, Council President Wesson. My name is Mark Lassick, and I'm a policy analyst with Community Health Councils. We would like to commend you and Council Members Paul Krikorian, Eric Garcetti, Tom LaBonge, and Ed Reyes for introducing the motion directing the city attorney to draft a resolution for a measure to provide a dedicated revenue stream and raise $39 per parcel for city parks and park programs. CHC fully supports the goal of this motion to expand access to quality open space and ensure the financial sustainability of our park system. We take this opportunity to provide the following recommendations as the city moves forward in developing the resolution and ballot measure. The resolution and ballot measure should include the allocation of funding for programs, maintenance, acquisition, and the development and periodic update of a citywide parks master plan. As you know, a 2009 Department of Recreation and Parks needs assessment concluded this, that the city lacks the appropriate levels of neighborhood and community parks. It is therefore critical that the shortage of open space and recreation space be included in the use of this p potential revenue source. The ballot measure should address the inequity of open space in underserved communities based on the park needs assessment and citywide park master plan. Numerous studies have documented the inequity in open recreational space in communities of color in Los Angeles. By example, city residents of South Los Angeles have access to only 1.2 acres of parkland per 1,000 residents. The ballot measure should provide the equitable, equitable distribution of funding across communities, programs, maintenance, and acquisition. The ballot measure should not create an unintended financial hardship on low-income homeowners. While we support the concept of a parcel tax, the tax as con contemplated in the motion represents a regressive tax. The City Council must make measures to structure the parcel tax to reduce or eliminate the burden of low and fixed income parcels. The resolution and ballot measure should provide for maintenance and effort for the City. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mike. So you're the second McCosker I've spent a few moments with uh, this week. Good to see you. Our following mic will be Mel Wilson and Robert Garcia. Go on, Mike. Morning, Mr. Chairman, member who's our, I'll try to undo the damage that was done by your earlier contact. <laughs> uh, United Firefighters uh, supports this in an unqualified way. Uh, we, we, will, we support it now and we'll support it in whatever where reform it can be anticipated uh, will eventually go on the ballot. We under, we've always understood, and, and I think we've been consistent in our public statements, public comment, that the full range of city services form a um, public safety continuum. Uh, it, some services more than others, to, admittedly, but, but parks and recreation programs are, are certainly central uh, in, in, in the top, what we would would call the top tier of, of, of services. Uh, we, our members see that every day. They see it in a very real way, viscerally, how important these programs are. Uh, I, I'm also confident that you can measure the impact that these have on, on, on not just quality of life, but actual public safety impacts. So um, we look forward to this. We were enthusiastic about it going forward. We would ask, though, and make a suggestion that you, as it goes forward, you consider and you're, you're the maker of the motion, uh, you consider amending it in such a way, if it's appropriate, to include fire and paramedic protection, and if not appropriate, that you consider a similar measure. I think partial, parcel taxes are the way to go. It certainly uh, is a way to provide important city services without the danger of the kind of bait and switch that sometimes goes on. Thank you. No, thank you. Mel, followed by Robert Garcia, followed by Steve Weingarten. Good morning, Mr. President, Mr. Wezar. I'm not here to speak on this parcel tax, sir. My item is on the special committee uh, dealing with the transfer tax. So okay, so then I just misfiled okay. your card. So I will be calling you up when we get to, I believe it's item 10. I Thank you. Okay, so if I could have Robert Garcia, Steve Weingarten. Steve, are you here? Okay. Yes, sir. Good morning. 
Uh, it's a real pleasure to appear before this uh, committee. Uh, I, we support dedicated park funding for the children and people of Los Angeles um, with, a, with an equity plan in place to ensure that the funds are distributed equitably for all the people of Los Angeles. We have no doubt that our good friend Steve Sobroff um, can make this happen. Uh, he and I had the pleasure of serving together on the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee for the Los Angeles Unified School District when um, Council Member Huizar was a, a school board member and chair of the school board. Um, we put together ultimately $27 billion for school construction and modernization and placed those schools in the centers of their community to make Los Angeles better for all. We think a similar approach will work here and we are committed to working with the city, the city attorney, uh, Steve Sobroff, and the people of Los Angeles to ensure that dedicated park funding will be invested equitably for all. LA is park poor and there are unfair disparities in who has access to parks and park programs. In the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression, we think voters will vote to tax themselves to create parks, to create quality green jobs, and to provide a better future for the children of Los Angeles. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, come on. Oh, they... Good morning, Councilman. My name is Steve Weingarten, and on behalf of People for Parks, I urge you to give voters a chance to approve a parcel tax for public recreation. And if approved, to use the funds it generates to restore service cuts and to respect the city <laughs> charter. Uh, we've all heard the argument that safety, medical, and utilities are essential government services, but that parks, libraries, and the arts are discretionary. Uh, it's an outdated view, but elected officials across the country have uh, fallen in line. Even progressives have been tripped up. I'm not the only Angelino who sees parks, schools, and libraries as the bedrocks of livable, healthy neighborhoods, even during bad times. Voters approved Measure L to ensure that libraries are properly funded, and I have no doubt that LA voters will also support a parcel tax for parks. But this measure should not have been necessary. For more than 80 years, through boom and bust, the city charter protected the park budget by allocating a fixed percentage of revenue. For the last four years, though, the mayor and this council have undermined the charter by charging rec and parks more and more for services that were unbilled for decades. These chargebacks amount to Robin Hood in reverse, where one of the poor city departments props up some of the richest. A parcel tax is expected to generate $30 million annually. That won't even restore the $44 million in chargebacks the department paid last year. People for Parks is concerned that tax revenue could also be siphoned off. These cuts have been hard on the workers and the public. Hundreds of employees have lost full-time and part-time in positions, and tens of thousands of young people, seniors, and working families have lost what access they had to a healthy lifestyle. People for Parks is determined to reverse this trend. Parks are not a luxury. Public recreation is the thin green line holding safe communities together. We urge you to put this measure on the ballot, to use the funds it generates to restore cuts, and to respect the city charter. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the public comment on that item has been complete. So what I'm going to recommend, uh, Madam Clerk, is that uh, we will send this motion to council without recommendation. However, we will instruct the CAO and the CLA to report to, to council with their analy analysis. So without objection, uh, that'll be the order. Okay. Mr. Weezar has to leave, so I'm going to recess the regular meeting and we'll go into the special meeting and I'll handle these last few items myself. Mr. Weezar, thank you for coming. So that brings us, and, and, and Mel, your item 11. That's your item. Um, if you could read item 10. 
Item 10 is a joint report from the City Administrative Officer and the Chief Legislative Analyst relative to an analysis of a proposed parking occupancy tax ballot measure. Okay, I have public comment cards on that. I got Greg Spiker. There's a heck of a lot of spikers, I tell you. I got Greg Spiker. I've got Richard. Richard, I can't make out your last name, Parking Concepts, Inc. I got Annie, Ann from the uh, Central City Association. Where's Ann Williams? Okay, I want to, I call three names. I'd like to see three people. Go ahead, Mr. Spiker. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the opportunity. Greg Spiker, Ken Spiker and Associates. I'm here representing the Los Angeles Parking Association. We want to be on record today opposing any, uh, the, the parking occupancy tax increase uh, 10 to 15 percent. I'm also authorized to, to speak on behalf of the uh, Building Owners Management Association, BOMA, who voted yesterday to oppose this as well. Um, the reality is it's really, we're not just talking about the parking industry, but uh, tax increase in general is just the wrong thing to do at this time. But one thing I, I think you need to consider is that um, in the CAO report, it talks about parking uh, taxes in other cities throughout the country, San Francisco, Pittsburgh, Chicago as an example. But the reality is we're not competing against, our industry is not competing against those cities. What we, what we are competing against is Beverly Hills, Culver City, El Segundo, and places like that where people have a choice to to uh, you know, go to dine, uh, shop, and in many of those cities, there is no parking occupancy tax at all. So it will have an impact, a ripple effect on on other industries, uh, and we just we just believe that there's other alternatives. We recognize the city has a budget shortfall, uh, but we believe there's alternatives the city can consider specific to the parking industry, such as going further in terms of privatization in your parking operations. Uh, being a little bit more aggressive in terms of enforcement of the existing uh, parking option tag. There's $20 million that's uncollected out there. We'd like to see the city be a little more aggressive in that regard. Uh, so there's things that can be done. So we just wanted to be on record. We, we oppose this and uh, look forward to talking to you uh, further about alternatives to uh, you know, helping the city raise revenue and, uh, and, and greater efficiencies. Thank okay. You. All right, Richard, followed by Ann. Good morning, sir. My name is Richard Raskin. Richard Raskin. I got it now. Perfect. I, uh, I work for Parking Concepts. I also represent the Los Angeles Parking Association. I'm aware of, of the measure and its need. I also reviewed the consultant's report, and what I want to talk about is primarily the ripple effect that the consultants mentioned in their report that they were not able to, to uh, analyze. The effect of a 50% increase in the parking tax from 10% where it is presently now to 15% will have an effect on almost everybody in this city. It will have an effect on the people that park, it will have an effect on the parking operators, it will have an effect on the business owners. A property owner that has a parking facility can expect to pass on tens of thousands of dollars in additional tax to their tenants. A property excuse me, a parking operator will have to pass on that as well. And the, the ripple effect will be that a lot of business owners will make decisions about moving their business or finding less expensive parking in other areas. And that's going to have a, an undesirable effect. But the most important effect that I want to bring forward is the largest employers in the city of Los Angeles outside of government are the hotel and restaurant industries. Their employees are typically lower paid employees and they're forced to fend for themselves with parking. They pay anywhere between five to seven to eight to ten dollars a day for parking. This will have a, a very undesirable effect on them as they now will have an additional ten to twenty dollars in parking increased fees per month, which translates directly to about three to four more hours of net pay a month that they would have to work just to pay for the increase in the parking occupancy tax. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Williams. Good morning. I'm Ann Williams with the Central City Association, representing nearly 450 businesses and also the Downtown Center Business Improvement District, representing 1,500 property owners in downtown Los Angeles. While a tax increase theoretically is spread among all Angelinos who must pay to park, in practice, this will dis disproportionately affect business. And let's step back for a minute. 
and think about this. A 50% increase in the parking, in, uh, parking occupancy tax does not just affect the parking industry. It affects building owners and managers who are trying to lease out office space. In this tight market, why would a potential tenant thinking of locating in Los Angeles sign up to pay these parking taxes when they could go to one of LA's neighboring cities? A parking tax increase would just worsen what is already a competitive disadvantage for our city. This is another burden on commuting Angelinos who are already paying over $5 a gallon for gas, and it would be a tax on retail, restaurants, hotels, and hospitality venues that rely on reasonable parking rates. And we know that the hospitality sector is one of the few bright spots in our struggling local economy. Unfortunately, a 50% increase in the parking tax would impact every Angelino who pays to park in our city. Uh, we know that the city has serious budgetary problems, and we support trying to maximize revenues, but we just think this is not the way to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Madam Clerk, on this item, and see uh, Ann, Richard, and Spiker, I just wanted you guys to, uh, you know, do the work that you were hired to do, but uh, I'm not going to send this to the uh, uh, council floor. I'm going to recommend that uh, we just note and file uh, the joint CAO and CLA report because I share some of the same concerns that you do. So if this issue rears its head again, it won't be by myself. Okay, so now we go to item 11. Could you please read item 11, Madam Clerk? Item 11 is a joint report from the City Administrative Officer and the Chief Legislative Analyst relative to an analysis of a proposed documentary transfer tax ballot measure. Okay, Mel and James, please come forward. Good morning again, Mr. President. Mel morning. Wilson. Uh, Mr. President, I just want to let you know that I appreciate the fact that the City Council, the Mayor, and all of the folks who are involved in the city government, <clears throat> excuse me, have done a lot of hard work over the last several years trying to trim its budget. Uh, we know that thousands of uh, employees have been laid off. We know that a lot of labor negotiations have to be relooked at. But I also want to tell you another side, and that is the side of the folks who have been devastated as a result of this economy over the last four years. Homeowners. Homeowners have lost. 50% or more of their value in their properties, which is basically where their savings has been at. And so uh, this brings us to this issue of this transfer tax that's being proposed. The City of Los Angeles Housing Department has already declared that this city is suffering through a foreclosure crisis to double a transfer tax that's already hitting those who are would-be homeowners and those who are currently homeowners would be just another kick in the teeth while they're down. 50% of all the properties that are selling today are distressed properties. They're foreclosures or they're short sales. Piling on with another tax at the time when someone's trying to live a part of the American dream is just not fair. Homeowners, would-be homeowners believe that there are other alternatives to look at before you uh, put this on the ballot. We think that looking at the assets that the City of Los Angeles has, we, we know that the General Services Department has already inventoried the assets but have never put them out for sale. We think that there are other avenues to look at as well. Please do not kick the homeowners in the teeth when they're already down, and please do not stop the folks who have the dream of being a property owner at the time uh, that we are at this Thanks. time. Thank Thanks you so much. much. James. And good to see you. Good morning, sir. James Litz, representing the Beverly Hills Greater Los Angeles Association of Realtors. And uh, we appreciate the financial position of the city. We want to help find a solution to this as well, because it is the quality of life of the homeowners that we represent that is affected every day, the sidewalks, the trees, and the streets. So the new proposal that is before us, we have not taken an official position yet. We want to study it further. We appreciate the dialogue with Mr. Santana and his capable staff on this issue and look forward to continuing the dialogue into the future so we can find a solution to this problem and help you move forward with uh, the operation of the city. Thank you. Thanks, James. And let me re reiterate what I said earlier. 
I'm going to uh, send uh, this, Madam Clerk, to the council without a recommendation as well. The, so that means two of the three items we're, we're sending to the full council where we could have more dialogue, more discussion, and I'm sure there'll be additional, additional tweaks uh, to this, or we might just replace one of these with something different. But I do want to have that over there so that uh, we can continue this conversation. So uh, without objection, we'll just send the joint uh, CAO and CLA report. That would be on item 11. That brings us to item 12. If you could, if the city clerks, June, could come forward, and would you, you want to read this, or must we read this one as yes. well? Well, then let us read it. And this is a verbal update from the city clerk on potential ballot initiatives proposed by the public. Okay. Hey, June. Good morning, honorable members. June Lagme, representing the city clerk's office. And uh, my staff is here, Holly Walcott, executive officer, and Ginny Pack, assistant election chief. I thought it would be helpful if I um, offered a few broad strokes of procedure uh, before we get into de details of the conversation. Ballot measures can get onto the ballot by citizen proponents via a petition process. This can take the form of an ordinance initiative that would add or change provisions in the city's ad or muni code. An initiative to remove an existing city ordinance is called a referendum. Or a ballot measure driven by citizens can be a charter initiative to add, delete, or change provisions in the LA City Charter. Qualifying for these two types of petition-driven initiatives are two different processes altogether. They are extremely detailed processes outlined in the city's election code and the city charter. In the case of petition-driven charter changes, a different state law governs. When the council initiates ballot measures, the deadlines to achieve placement on a desired election date are clear. However, for petition-driven initiatives, many variables are involved in the timing. The city's election code and charter and state law only specify the maximum number of days to complete each action step, not when each step must be taken. Primarily, exactly when in the process signatures are submitted, the quality of those signatures, and how many signatures are submitted all factor in on whether or not a petition was submitted in time to make the next ballot. For your information, there will be no petition-driven initiatives on the city's upcoming March 2013 primary election. However, there are currently in progress two ordinance initiatives, both dealing with marijuana dispensaries and one charter initiative dealing with the city's pension systems, which are in progress that may qualify in time for a future election. I would like to now turn this over to Ginny Pack, our election assistant chief, to update you on the status of each of these three different particular initiatives. Thank you. Go right ahead. Good morning, Ginny uh, Pack, City Clerk Election Division. The first update I'd like to give you is on Medical Marijuana Collectives, as it's been titled. On October 1st, the proponents submitted the proposed language and a request for the city attorney to prepare the title and summary of that measure. Uh, the city attorney had 10 days to prepare that. The proponents took the title and summary and have submitted a draft petition for our office review on October 15th. We have until October 25th to review and or approve that petition. If and once the petition is approved, the circulators may start circulating the petition. And if they have at least 41, or once they file, and they have collected at least 41,138 valid signatures, we will do our verification process. Once found sufficient, the clerk will certify to council, and council must act within 20 days to either adopt the ordinance or submit it to the voters. Um, I am weeded out. I know that that's not the way you say it. We just weed, weed, weed. Okay. <laughs> weed, 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 weed. Go, go on. Okay. So we have another weed item. So that one. I uh, like this woman. 
She's sharp and quick on her feet. Go um, on. So the second marijuana item is so far self-titled Safe Neighborhoods and Safe Access. The proponent submitted that proposed language and the request for title and summary on October 12th. The city attorney is currently preparing that and has 10 days to do so, which would be October 22nd. And once again, the steps, the next steps would be the same as the first item. So the next step would be for the proponents to take the title and summary and drop the petition back to us. What's the, the next one? The next item or is the charter initiative. And again, as the city clerk mentioned, that's uh, regulated by state law. And while the process is similar, the number of signatures to submit and time frames are a little varied. On October 15th, the proponent submitted the language and request for a title and summary to our office. The city attorney has 15 days to respond. So that would make it October 30th to prepare the title and summary. Once the uh, proponent receives the title and summary, they have a, um, uh, they may start circulating the petition. They must file at least 200, about 255,000 signatures t for us to start verifying the signatures. And once again, if found sufficient, council must act and submit that to the voters. What's the deadline as to when they uh, submit the signatures to us? No, get the Holly Walcott, Executive Officer, Office of the City Clerk. There's two different deadlines. Um, one is a hard deadline, which was the um, December 7th date for the um, tr no. ordinance initiatives. No. Well, um, for the regular ordinance initiatives, technically, once the draft petition is approved for circulation, they have um, two years to circulate, but once it's filed, we only uh, verify the signatures that were collected 120 days before the filing. For the charter initiative, once the draft petition is, uh, sorry, once the proponents receive the title and summary, they have 180 days from that point to file. So that means they have 180 days to turn in 200 and some odd thousand. That would be the maximum number of days. Okay. The other difference, too, is that on the ordinance petitions, um, the proponents have to get approval from us as far as the title summary and the text of the actual petition. But for the charter initiative, we do approve the title and summary, but we do not have authority to uh, approve their text. The text, they publish it, and it goes exactly as they write it. Okay, and let's do, I, I forgot to ask you a question about the two weed proposals. What, what do they do? The city clerk is not in a position to provide you with that analysis. The best I can uh, offer is that the first one, which we're calling Marijuana One, um, has already been given a title and summary. MJ1. MJ1. Um, and um, Jeannie, could you uh, could you play some Rick James music uh, for us? You want the title? No, no. I was just no, don't start searching for it. Okay, no, I'm fine. I I I, I was just going to basically have you say what what it was for the public. But no, I'm good with that. So I want to thank you. Is there more? Did I miss something? For any questions? No. Okay, we're good. No questions. Now I want to adjourn the special meeting, return to the regular meeting. Thank you, June and staff and crew. Uh, do we have any more items on the regular committee agenda? That completes all items on the regular and special. This committee is adjourned. Thank you all. Weed, weed, weed.